Sharon in the this new session has special special characteristic and special need which we have the honor to have the coming president of IDF with us. It is my honor to invite Professor Shaukat Sadikut, my dear friend, and the coming president of IDF starting from 2015, last 2015, December 2015. And he has a special taste. He's from our background, knows everything about the diabetic patient, about the resources, who is the poor, who is the rich, how can we manage. And I think his lecture about the guidelines <coughs> and its efficacy in the management of diabetes will be more than this. I think he will deliver to us information to the countries with limited resources and how it can deal with. Professor Shafat Sadiq, welcome. First, like to thank Kamal and my friend Anel and all the other people from UEDA who have invited me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here because, frankly, you feel that you're among friends. And uh, like I always tell anybody, that you go to Egypt and tell somebody you're from India, and it's like coming home. That's not a problem at all. Now, what I'm going to talk about is a problem. We all agree. All of us are here because we agree that there is some problem with diabetes management. Okay? The question is, what is that problem? We have to sit back sometimes and think as to what is the problem. You know, in India we have this great belief. It's written in our stars. It's written in our future. The problem really is, is it always written in our future, in which case we can't do anything? Or is it in our hands? And that is what I would like to sort of discuss. Now, 2004, if you look at it, 2004, they said that the world population of diabetes was 177 million, India had 31.7 million, China had 20.8 million, and what they said was that in 2030, there will be 366 million people with diabetes. That 366 million was reached in 2011. And in fact, now it is slated to reach 552 million by 2030. So that is how bad the problem is. It is just going up and up and up by tsunami proportions. Look at the idea of Atlas which came out uh, a few years, a couple of years back. And they said that there were 382 million people with diabetes in 2030. And that there would be 592 million people by 2035, more than a 55% increase. That number itself is tremendously poor. Diabetes caused 5.1 million deaths in 2030. In fact, every six person, seconds, a person dies from diabetes. That is how bad the problem is. Just think about it. By the time I finish the sentence, somebody has died because of a diabetes-related complication. The top 10 countries, China is now overtaken India. And like I always tell my Chinese friends, that any time they want to take over the uh, I don't mind giving them the gold medal, I'll give them the silver medal, I'll give them the bronze medal. Just take over all our people from the, with diabetes. And look at this. Undiagnosed diabetes, half the people are undiagnosed. That is where the problem comes in. Mortality, people die early. 55% in India, 76% in Africa, 50% everywhere else. And okay, they're a little low here, but this is where we have to concentrate on. So basically what happened? In 2001, when we had the IDF meeting in Dubai, it, uh, it, was, it was said that 
every seven seconds a person dies because of diabetes. Last year we had a meeting in Melbourne, it was calculated that it's not every seven seconds, in fact every two, uh, six seconds a person dies because of diabetes. So now I ask you to think about it. In the last two or three years, we have attended lots of lectures, we have attended, we have read a lot, new medicines have come up, everything is becoming better. Our knowledge is more, medicines are more, everything is more. Then why is it, just think about it, why is it that we are not able to make the lives of our patients with diabetes better? What is the use of all that knowledge, what is the use of all those medicines if we are not able to get it and make their lives better? Today you know that uh, every two, every three seconds a person is diagnosed with diabetes. Every six seconds a person dies with diabetes. And every 20 seconds a person loses his foot because of diabetes. That is how bad the problem is. And we keep, I'm sorry to have to say this, but I have made one rule in Diabetes India, which is my organization in India, that before you hold the next conference, you sit back and think as to have you tried to do something to make a difference or not. Otherwise, holding a conference by itself doesn't make sense to me at least. Now, look at this. In spite of the significant advances which have been made in the knowledge and management options for treating diabetes, we see pandemics of P2DM and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. <coughs> and if we don't sort of sit back and think as to why, then I think we are like this person who just got his head inside and he does nothing. First of all, why bother about diabetes? Well, I am talking about India. Uh, diabetes is seen in increasing numbers, especially in areas of rapid urbanization. It is being increasingly diagnosed with people at a younger age group. You know, when, when I was a resident, type 2 diabetes means uh, 40 years, 45 years old person. Today we are seeing type 2 diabetes at the age of 15, 16, 17. That is how bad the problem has become. The complications of diabetes are occurring earlier and the numbers of diabetes but not diagnosed, that is half of them are not diagnosed. Today, diabetes is the largest cause of non-traumatic lower limb amputations, the largest cause of blindness. One in three people undergoing dialysis are those with diabetes. 80% of diabetes patients will die of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And by the time you read this, one person will have died from diabetes related complications and two will have had a diagnosis. That is the problem, that is the situation right now. So obviously we need to find answers. The question is, what is the answer? But before we even think of looking at the uh, answers, I think let's find out what is the question. It's only when you have the right question to ask, will the right answers come about. Like I said, in the past decade or so, every international organization has come out with guidelines, advisories, initiatives to manage diabetes, hypertension, lipids, obesity, everything, the metabolic syndrome. The problem really is this, that new medicines have come, new knowledge is there, guidelines are there, everything is there. And yet, most people with diabetes are not at ABC optimal level, that is HDA1C, blood pressure, cholesterol. They are not, in fact most of them are not even near optimal control level. Let me ask you, many of us treat diabetes, how many of your diabetic patients have HDA1C of 6 or 6.5? How many? About 15-20% is what I would say. And maybe, uh, if you don't mind my saying so, I agree that about 10% of them are there at 6.5 in spite of what we do rather than because of what we do. So, so why should this be so in spite of the guidelines, publicity and all that? But one can always blame patient apathy and even clinical inertia. But can it be lack of knowledge? Now you would say that what is lack of knowledge? Here you are a person who is attending conferences, you are reading journals, you are discussing everything and why should there be lack of knowledge? You see, look at the medical scenario. This is of course in India, but I have been traveling all over the world and this is a fact everywhere else. Remember that in India, 95-96% of all people are seen by family or general practitioners. Family physicians or general practitioners, that's all. Not only seen by them, but only seen by them. So that is the problem. Family physicians include those trained in traditional systems of medicine such as Unani, Ayurveda, Homeopathy. We also have our Indian version 
of a, a, barefoot, a Chinese barefoot doctor. Any person who has worked with a doctor for eight years can get a certificate and start practicing. Even allopathic doctors, there was no system of compulsory continuing education. And moreover, there is a relative lack of good medical facilities in rural areas where more than 75% of our people live. Now, this is something that we have to sit back and think about. So, the question really is, what are we going to do? Are we going to sit, am I going to sit, say, in Mumbai and decide, yes, I know everything. I see 20 patients a day and they're doing fine. So, that's all that I have to do? No. The problem really is, we have the knowledge, we have everything. But it has to be accessible so that it is available to the common person. We have to come out of our, you know, the university towers, the academic towers and go down to the ground reality for this is the person we have to help. Not our brains, not us, but this is the person we have to help. What is clinically relevant education? Remember that when you talk to most primary care physicians, they do not want highly academic guidelines in education. It must take into consideration the ground realities, take the views of the uh, people on the ground and the management, including diagnosis, should be available, accessible and affordable to the people. And mostly, I think, we shouldn't forget to kiss. Now, I'll tell you uh, basically a little thing about the kiss. Uh, I've been, I'm now married for 40 years and my wife doesn't even bother about me. But the point really is that uh, when we were married, for six months or something and uh, we were in medical college together, we married in six months and I was making up a presentation and she saw the presentation and left a note for me saying, Shaka, don't forget to kiss. So I said, not bad, I mean, okay. What did she mean? Keep it scientifically simple. Problem really is, who are you talking to? You have to talk, keep it simple. And that is what I think we have to do. Our academic guidelines and everything are extremely good. But they have to be translated so they can be used by common people in the day-to-day -day practice. And this is something that I want to talk about. See, uh, in Diabetes India, we did a survey of 1,000 randomly selected diabetes patients family physicians, 50 from small towns and 50 from rural areas. And remember in India, a rural area is defined as having a population of less than 5,000. So we took 50 doctors from them, 50 doctors from very small towns and took a thousand of their patients with diabetes and just did some study on them. And besides all this, look at this, this is what I am going to concentrate on today. 84% of atherogenic dyslipidemia and or raised LDLC. 84%. So what did we do? We said that okay, for these 100 doctors, we are going to take a half an hour lecture and half an hour of interaction. That's it. And what did we do in that lecture? We told them the basic lipid disorders to look for are raised LDLC, low levels of HDLC and raised levels of serum triglycerides. We gave them what the targets are. Then we told them the first step is to normalize the LDLC levels. Next, normalize the triglycerides, unless the triglycerides are more than 500, in which case you normalize this before treating LDLC. Then we told them about lifestyle changes. Now, basically, again, you have to understand one thing about India. India is a very diverse country. The world is a very diverse country. So, similarly, to sort of tell them, no, no, you must only eat this, you must only eat that, you must only eat that, is not going to work. Because people are going to eat what is their food, what is commonly available and what is cheap. And that is something we have to understand. So let's not make vague rules about how we must have uh, this and you cannot have this, you cannot have this. People are going to eat whatever is available. You must also understand one thing, that 40% of India, especially most of them living in the rural areas, in fact, earn less than one dollar a day. One dollar a day. That is unfortunately a problem. Things are changing. And so what did we do? We told them to, how to advise the patient. Now what happens if you see it in Bombay, people will tell, oh you must have double refined virgin olive oil. You can afford it. Where am I supposed, even if I can get it, okay these days you can get it in Bombay, but where are the people living in rural areas going to get it? Can they even afford it? So what we did was, we told the doctors, tell your patients. Whatever oil or ghee that you use in your cooking, cut it by half. Cut it by half. We've done it. We've shown that.
that it takes the food taste just the same and nothing happens. We told them as far as possible do not keep reusing the same oil because of the trans fatty acids. But again, one has to understand that I can I can tell people that, but you have to understand that they have to be able to follow it, they have to have the money to be able to follow it. And that's why we just gave standard this thing. And then we told them, forget it. You don't want to tell uh, your patients don't have money or don't, uh, there is no testing available because they are in the villages. Start them on a small dose of strategy. Medicines fortunately in India are very cheap because there are a huge number of Indian companies which are making medicines. We told them start a statin on them unless there is any side effects and told them to look for statins. That's it. At the interaction, you know what a lot of people told me? Is that Doc, thank you for telling us this thing, simple thing. Because people come sometimes and take lectures for us and even if they are talking of lipids, they will start talking of lipoprotein A2 and lipoprotein B100. Now why should I know about them? I am sitting in my clinic, there are 25 patients coming in, there are 25 illnesses. I don't want to become an expert in lipids. All I want to do is for you all to come and tell me that this is the way forward, this is what you should do and okay, start a statin, start metformin, start sulfonylurea, whatever it is, just tell me that, don't tell me how it works and how it doesn't work. So subsequently after one year, we went to the same doctors and again took up a uh, thousand of their patients and what did we find? We found that one year after the end of the education initiative, 41% of the diabetes patients are atherogenic in slightly. Now you will say that 41% is nothing great. Obviously it's nothing great. But remember the figure beforehand. It was 84%. It's come down to 41%. And that is what is important. Because at the end of the day, I want to know have I made a difference? Am I going to make a difference to the patients or not? So it is possible to be on target, but let's try and understand that you know we have patient education very important our education very important but when you are in a war and we are in a war against diabetes let's not mistake that we are in a definite war against diabetes then being a general and sitting in the big four doesn't help if you have to fight the front line the front line that is going to help us fight diabetes are the primary care physicians the general physicians and you have to empower them, you have to do something about their knowledge so that they are able to treat their people better. Is this the way forward? You'd think God would know, but even He says He's not sure either. Neither am I. The point really is that I love talking to people, meeting people, because there will be some answers somewhere which you can give us and which we can work together and do something about. Let us not play the blame game in, in India. Blame the government if something goes wrong, that stupid government does, not, does nothing for us. And blame the pharma people, all they want to do is blame money. Blame the society, blame the patient. Of course, we never blame the doctors. I mean, how can we blame ourselves? So as a recap, remember, we have to stop the clock. The complications are getting too much. <coughs> the road ahead, like I said, is not easy. The problem really is that we've got to sit and think, how are we going to make use of those gaps. How are we going to empower our uh, primary care physicians? And that is what we have to do. It is in our hands. All of us have to work together as equals. Whether I come from India or somebody comes from Brussels or somebody comes from any other country or somebody comes from the rural areas of uh, any country. We all have to work together because I think, uh, you know, most of us are good people. Uh, we, uh, Einstein once said that bad things happen not because of bad people. Bad things happen because good people are not willing to kind of stand up and fight. And therefore I think the whole problem really would be that we've got to come together, we've got to work together, take the knowledge down to the people so that they are able to help their people with diabetes. Is it going to be easy? Of course not. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard, it's going to be long, long this thing. But I have to end by telling you something that Mahatma Gandhi once said, that whenever thinking of doing any initiative, Think of the most poor and the vulnerable person and if what you are doing is going to bring a small smile to that person's face then it must be done irrespective of the cost, irrespective of the hard work and I think diabetes has reached a problem where it is affecting millions and millions of poor vulnerable people who have nowhere else to go and I think it is for us now to sit back and think as to what we are going to do about it. Thank you. Gracias.
can I do the lectures? Uh, uh, a couple of questions now because I've got to go back for my IVF meeting. Any questions?